hey guys, I have developed a really cool mnemonic when I was studying for the last few days at heme synthesis, kind of looking at some of the different porphyrias that can develop and also how they end up relating to anemia of chronic disease that kind of plays into pathology. So it's pretty high yield and they can have different, I can ask different questions on this for different board exams. So let's get right into this. We're going to start with an overview and this really isn't the point of the video to go through every step. I imagine that you've been studying this pathway for a little bit and you're trying to find an easier way to memorize some of the different high yield parts of it. But I need to start with an overview so that everything else will make sense when the mnemonic shows up. So first of all, succinyl -CoA, CoA plus glycine is going to go to form ALA and this is uh, with the enzyme ALA synthase. Then ALA is going to go to end up forming porphobilinogen and I'm abbreviating that but that's porphobilinogen and that's going to be the enzyme ALA dehydratase and then porphobilinogen is going to end up going into uro porphyrinogen. I'm just going to put uro, and that's using the enzyme. Uh, so basically, I hope you notice a pattern here. So other than this first one, so like looking at this first enzyme, other than this first one where the product is what's getting the name, all of these other enzymes in the rest of the pathway, except for that final one where it's called uh, ferroke. Uh, chelatase enzyme, all the rest of them are named after the reactant in the process. So it helps you to, so really, if you can remember that, you don't need to worry about, oh, what is, you know, looking at, a, for example, looking at ALA and, uh, looking at ALA and porphobilinogen, and you're trying to figure out what's the enzyme, the really important thing to memorize is this, because if you can remember that the reactant is the main thing, except for this first one, and except for the very last one, ALA synthase, see that's the product in the first one, so that's not, I'm not talking about that. Everything else except for that one and the ferrochelatase one at the very end to form heme uses the reactant in the enzyme title and then you just need to memorize the ending part. So back to what we were talking about. ALA goes into porphobilinogen with ALA dehydratase. Uh, porphobilinogen goes into ural porphyrinogen and again that's going to use this very first one. It's going to be porpho deaminase. Okay. And then uroporphyrinogen ends up going into coproporphyrinogen, right? I'm just going to abbreviate it again, just putting it, just it's not the whole word, but it's coproporphyrinogen. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And again, you look at it again, what, well, what's the enzyme? What's got to be the first one? It has to start with the first, the reactant in the, going from reactant to product. So we know it's uroporphyrinogen so it would be uroporphyrinogen, and then it's going to be decarboxylase here. And then we're going to go from coproporphyrinogen, and we're going to go from that to protoporphyrinogen. Okay, and again, we're going to use the first reactant, so we know that it has to start with the coproporphyrinogen, and this one is going to be oxidase. And then of course, we finally reach our destination where we can make heme protoporphyrinogen to heme, and that's going to use, this is kind of an unusual um, name here. It's kind of out of the ordinary compared to all these other titles. Um, it doesn't have a name that's involving the reactant here, ferrochelatase. Okay, apologize if I spelled that wrong. So I imagine you've already looked in a lot of those details. So now that I've said that, I want to show you a really cool uh, way that I've developed getting into the porphyrias and to help memorize this really confusing part of the pathway. All of this part that's in these brackets, it's very difficult to learn it from porphobilinogen. You know, it's like what comes next? Is it the euro one? Is it the copro one? Is it the proto? And you can easily get those mixed up. Well, this mnemonic will help you. The mnemonic is this. Pork usually contains protein. And this isn't one of those stupid mnemonics where it's like, oh, well, it's only the first letter. Well, that could be a million words, you know, like one letter isn't going to help you. Look at, look at how I've set this up. Pork has three of the letters of the word. So it's not like you're stuck on just thinking, what could one letter stand for in that mnemonic? Pork, P-O-R. 
and I've started this mnemonic past the stuff that's pretty easy to remember. So we're ignoring all of this easier stuff right here, and we're getting right into the part that's hard to remember. The correct order of porphobilinogen, uroporphyrinogen, coproporphyrinogen, protoporphyrinogen, that's the hard stuff right there, and that's where the two important porphyrias play, come into play as well. So pork, that's telling you, P-O-R is starting right here. Porphobilinogen, right? Pork for porpho. Bilinogen. And the next word, usually, so then right after that, usually U for euro porphyrinogen, right? Porphyrinogen. Now you're like, oh well that only has one that only has one letter. How is that helpful? Well, because the only thing in the entire pathway that starts with a U is uroporphyrinogen. So that's enough in that example. So what comes next? Contains. Co. So not just a C to leave you confused. We have co. And notice anything else in this pathway, nothing else would fit in that example. So that's enough. Copro. Porphyrinogen. Okay. So see the beginning? Co. And that helps you remember the co word. And then we go into, I'm just running out of space. So I'm going to go down here. And then we end with the prot. That's perfect. Protein. Proto. Proto. Or for a renogen. See? Super easy then. And the other stuff's pretty easy to remember. I mean, it's it's basically it's unique to the pathway. It doesn't sound the same as everything else. So you know, succinylcholine plus glycine goes to ALA which then gets into porphobilinogen, and then it gets into the hard part. And then over here, we know once you reach por uh, protoporphyrinogen, the only thing left after our mnemonic is just to get heme. And also remember, just remember some of the important things, like lead inhibits right here, and then it also inhibits right here. So that's lead inhibits both of those spots. So like lead poisoning could uh, stop both of those. Also, if you go through the entire pathway, a buildup of heme, will come back and inhibit the very first rate limiting step, which is succinyl-CoA plus glycine going, forming ALA. A really high level of heme, the final product, will negatively inhibit that rate limiting first step. So that's kind of common sense. Negative inhibition happens at the very first step, which is the most efficient way to do it. Okay, so that's how the mnemonic works, but it doesn't end there. It gets even cooler. Look now, this even works for the porphyrias. So, Remember, so the two important porphyrias that you need to know, acute, intermittent, I'm abbreviating again, porphyria, porphyria, and then the second important one, porphyria, porphyria cutanea tarda. Okay? So those are the two really important ones. And remember some of the symptoms, I mean, you know, stuff you just have to remember for the USMLE Step 1 or the Biochem MBME. You know that in acute um, intermittent porphyria, you have uh, GI symptoms. That, that do, so I'm, only, I'm putting symptoms here. We know that there's neurological symptoms in both of them. We know that there's uh, other, like, similar symptoms that a lot of similar symptoms that both of these will have. I'm not, I'm only putting symptoms that are characteristic and can distinguish between, uh, you know, from the other porphyrias. So GI symptoms is in acute intermittent porphyria, but it's not in porphyria cutanea tarda. Okay? And so also, besides GI symptoms, in acute intermittent porphyria, I want you to look at the first word, acute. That sounds like you're saying something is, like, acute something, acute, let's think of acute pig, right? And we know pigs is what gives us pork, the meat pork, right? And remember where in the pathway pork was. So let's go back to our little path. We had succinyl-CoA, sorry, plus glycine. That's not really an important part. Going to ALA, other than that being the rate limiting step, that's very important to know. Um, but then we get into the hard part. ALA goes to, remember, porphobilinogen. And porpho sounds like pork, right? Another thing really cool that's going to work here is that you remember how you have to learn that port stain, uh, port wine urine, port wine colored urine, like a really dark red urine is what you'll see in acute intermittent um, porphyria. So a way to remember that, and that's literally how they describe it in a lot of QBank questions, 
port wine uh, urine. So that literally sounds just like pork, pork, wine, urine color, right? So that'll help you to remember that. It sounds like when you read port wine stain on a test, just say pork, wine, and that'll help you to remember that port wine urine is describing acute intermittent porphyria. Well, why is that important? Because over here, we know their skin, I'll talk more about that, uh, skin blistering and stuff like that. But when you get into the description of the urine color here, for porphyria cutanea tarda, it's described as tea colored. See, so something that s small can, can be distinguishing, you know. And so they may describe this as more as like brown colored urine, where this one more is like a dark purple or dark red urine. They could do it like that, but they may just flat out say port wine urine color. Um, in the patient's urine, so that could help you just pronounce it pork wine, and it'll help you remember where in the pathway this is. This is why this works so well. Let's get back to our pathway. Succinyl CoA plus glycine goes to ALA. We know it forms ALA. ALA forms porphobilinogen, and then we know we get the uroporphyrinogen, and then we get the co coproporphyrinogen, right? And then we end up getting the proto. Porphyrinogen, right? So that's our general pathway. Oh yeah, and then we get, sorry, and then we get uh, heme, the final product, the most important thing that we're trying to get here. So look how cool this is. In the mnemonic, pork, we've already decided that acute intermittent porphyria, it sounds like you're saying a cute, something's cute, like, a, like for example, a pig, a little baby pig, and that's referring to pork. So that tells you the defect is at, you're going to see an increase in the enzyme at the pork sounding one. So in an example of porphyria, where you're trying to figure out what, what are the lab values, where in the pathway are you going to see an increase? Where's the problem? It's right here. See, because you're going to see an increase in porf this uh, porphyrinogen starting at this. Now, of course, we know eventually if you have a huge backup of porphyrinogen, this will also go up and this will also go up. But it's starting as far as how far in the pathway does it go and where does it really start that then starts a chain reaction to go earlier in the pathway. It's starting right here at the one that sounds like pork. So acute pig, help, that'll help you remember that, and pork wine urine, GI symptoms. Um, so now we, can, now we know if it's at this spot, we've decided using our mnemonic, we know that it's messed up right here for acute intermittent porphyria between porphyrinogen and uroporphyrinogen. So we're, let's think back to the enzyme that that is for, and that is going to be a defect in porphyrinogen. Do y'all remember a defect in porphyrinogen? I'm sorry, porphobilinogen deaminase. I apologize for saying porphyrinogen, por porphobilinogen deaminase. So that's where the problem uh, with that one is. Now we move on to looking at some of the symptoms over here for porphyria cutanea tarda. We know that there's skin symptoms. Well, that should be very easy because cutanea, cutanea sounds like cutaneous tissue, and that's kind of in, that's underneath the skin. So that cutanea is kind of referring to the skin type area. So there's skin blisters in this one. That's pretty easy to know. They usually won't make it that easy to wear. Oh, skin blisters, that's a dead giveaway for porphyria cutanea tarda over acute intermittent porphyria. But here's one very distinguishing one. Tea-colored urine. Tea-colored urine. How do we remember tea-colored urine? Well, look at this. When you when you say porphyria cutanea tarda, I think of porphyria cutanea TT. You know, like little kids, they say, like you'll tell a little kid like you you have to go pee pee. You have to go like to the bathroom to go pee, right? Well, the ending tarda will help you remember TT because look, acute intermittent porphyria doesn't have any anything with a T where tarda. Tarda, you can say TT, you can say it like that. Why is that important to say TT here? Well, because it not only does that tell you what the symptom is this going to be, it's going to be tea-colored urine instead of port wine urine, but TT is also going to help you know where in our mnemonic and where in the cycle it is. For example, TT is referring to urine, right? We'll look at our pathway. There's one called uroporphyrinogen, and uro sounds like urine. So where's the problem here? The first starting increase for porphyria cutanea tarda is going to be at your porphyrinogen, and then of course it'll go upstream, and then you'll eventually have increases in porphobilinogen and ALA and succinyl CoA glycine backup and all that stuff. But it will start at this one right here in this example. So that means the defect is here. If you're having increasing levels of uro 
porphyrinogen, there's a, it's clearly getting backed up and it can't pass through here now. So you're having increasing levels of uro, porphyrinogen, and porphyria cutanea tarda. How do you remember that? Because porphyria cutanea tarda, TT, and that's another word for like a, like a slang for saying to go urinate or go pee, like you would tell a little kid. And of course, the skin blisters, again, it's in the word cutanea that I hope you remember. This one has skin blisters and uh, different things like that, skin problems in this example. So here's why this is important. In a question, they'll describe something that sounds like any sort of, it could sound like any porphyria, neurological symptoms and this and that. And they may give you GI symptoms and that'll help you kind of lean towards acute intermittent porphyria. But where it gets important is when they give you lab values. That's the most diagnostic. And they'll say that there's a decrease in copro, the copro porphyrinogen, right? Well, look at our two uh, porphyrias. You'll have a decrease in copro porphyrinogen in both of these because here there's a block in acute intermittent porphyria, there's a block here. And then in our other one, there's a block here. So that would go down in both of them. So where it gets really important is looking at if it was acute intermittent porphyria, it would be an increase in this por, uh, porphobilinogen, but it would be a decrease in uroporphyrinogen, see, because it's bl being blocked here. So it would be a decrease here. So that's why it's important to know the mnemonic. When you look at acute intermittent porphyria, you need to know acute, so think of like something is cute, like a pig. And that means that you're going to start having your increased levels. There's basically a blockade right at the uh, porphobilinogen. So in our mnemonic, pork usually contains protein. There's a block right here. And I'm just I'm just trying to drill this in your head, so I'm going to repeat a lot of stuff I've already said. In porphyria cutanea tarda, we know that if you just look at the word, well, cutanea, we know there's skin symptoms. And then also tarda, tarda, TT, kind of sounds similar. And if you can remember TT, you know that's dealing with urine, so that has to be a blockade. You're going to start seeing an increase at the uroporphyrinogen one. Your, so that'll be right here in the pathway. So that means that'll go up and then eventually all, and then plus all these other ones will be up as well. So all of that helps you distinguish. Again, tea colored urine, well of course, tea because of our mnemonic TT. And then, so you're using this primary mnemonic for all of this stuff. Pork usually contains protein. I hope this helped guys. Um, this helped me a lot. I studied this for, I don't know, maybe two days straight, just looking at these different pathways and trying to figure out ways to remember some of the symptoms and distinguishing characteristics. And this, to me, will get you almost any question that they can possibly ask you um, on the step one or on an MBME in biochemistry or pathology or however they may word it. I'll see you in another video, and I'll be trying to think of some other mnemonics in relation to some complex biochemistry topics. Um, I'll see you in the next video. See you guys.